the uh, flash flashing system uh, sorry the uh, transducing system will be uh, uh, kept at the uh, heart level mm -hmm. uh, that is phlebostatic axis and that is phlebostatic point okay, okay. what is the uh, where do you choose what is the phlebostatic axis uh, that is the junction between anterior and posterior wall uh, in the uh, in the fourth uh, intercostal space mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, roughly from external auditory meatus to the iliac crest, midpoint of the iliac crest, in the fourth RCS. Can somebody tell me what is the principle? She she told briefly about the uh, setup, and she was also talking about the trans the processor and all that. So, on what principle this arterial line works? Uh, the principle of the arterial line is conversion of mechanical energy into the electric energy. Yeah. On the monitor. Yeah, that is uh, yeah, that is called. There is a name for the principle. We will come to it. And how do you do zeroing? You told me. Uh, yeah. What What is leveling? Uh, I don't. I don't know, sir. Leveling. Leveling. You don't know. Somebody else wants to answer. What is zeroing and what is leveling? No, the principle is called Wheatstone Bridge Principle. Okay. And the, uh, exactly like what you said, which converts the mechanical to electrical uh, energy. And uh, how do you do the zeroing? You told that. And the leveling is a selection of a position of interest at which the reference standard is set zero. That is fourth intercostal. So this is how, this is where you are going to uh, place the transducer, irrespective of the change of the position of the patient. Okay. You told about the phlebostatic axis also. Yeah. Uh, next uh, important question is, what is square wave test? Can somebody else answer the question? Sir. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Square wave test uh, is done to uh, see if it is uh, if uh, arterial line is damped properly. So uh, to begin with, uh, the flush is open. Uh, the flush is open. The uh, flush is closed and then uh, quickly uh, quick closed and released, and uh, we'll see the oscillations. Uh, normally, if it is optimally damped, uh, one or two oscillations will uh, will come. If it is uh, two or more, then the system is uh, under damped. And if it is less than uh, two, then it is over damped. So as you said, fast flush, when you do the flushing, the entire system is exposed to the pressure in the column that you are maintaining, that is 300 mm of HG. 300 mm of HG is chosen so that you... Uh, you are setting the pressure over and above anybody's blood pressure can reach up to, okay? As you said, uh, it is adequately dampened, uh, appropriate waveform. You should be able to see the dichrotic notch appropriately. And once you release the fast flush, uh, 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 once you finish the plus test, you should be able to see not more than one and a half to two oscillations. And... You know, the amplitude of each oscillation should not be more than one third of the previous oscillation. That is adequate, uh, adequate system dampening. So uh, you already answered. Can somebody identify what is this? Under damped. So this is under damped uh, square wave test. One, uh, this is under damped waveform. Okay, so when you do the fast flush test, you will see multiple artifacts in the waveform and you can see that there are multiple oscillations after the fast flush test. And what happens in under damped uh, arterial waveform, your systolic uh, blood pressure is uh, overestimated and diastolic pressure is underestimated, whereas MAP remains same. So what are the causes of uh, under uh, damped waveform? So somebody answered this question yesterday. We had this uh, sort of you know, roughly during the scenarios we seen one one uh, trace like this. Uh, one long of your tubings. Answered, yeah. 
Yeah. Long tubings or increased vascular resistance. Yeah. So these are the causes. Uh, at least remember that stiff non-compliant long tubing can cause under damped tracing. The next one is tachycardia. If you don't remember anything, at least these two you have to remember. Hypothermia is okay, fine. So can somebody answer this? What is A? If B is normal waveform, what is A? Overturn. Under, huh? Come again. Over damp system. Over damp system. So what are the causes? Of over damp system. What, uh, what? How do you appreciate over damp system? When you do a fast flush test, you see that uh, the waveform is not appropriate. The dichrotic notch is lost. You know the systolic blood pressure is underestimated. Diastolic blood pressure is uh, overestimated. However, the map remains same. And after the flash, uh, fast flush test, you see that the oscillation is not normally happening. Oh. Causes, causes of uh, underdamped waveform. Blood clots, air oh. bubbles, yeah. lax tubings, no fluid in the bag or less pressure in the bag. Uh, if there is any kinks in the catheter and uh, when the uh, stop cock uh, is not working properly. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So, you know, friction. Super. Full right? Google answer. <laughs> <laughs> Possible. Uh, Anyway, uh, sorry, uh, I was just, no, I was just joking. I was, yeah, sir, I was preparing, sir. I'm sorry, I was just. <laughs> no, no, not just, 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 just. If not anything, please remember that if there are clots and bubbles, it cannot lead to adequate resonance of the system, leading to overdamped tracing. Okay, kinking, bubbles, and clots. Very important. So let us continue the case scenario where we left with. He received fluids and blood products. Hemoglobin is stable. Intubated in view of persisting shock, no, continues to have hypotension. So how do you decide more fluids? You want to administer, you want to decide whether you can administer fluids or not in this patient. He has already received more fluids and blood products. Hemoglobin is stable. Can somebody answer? How do you decide whether to give more fluids or not? IVC screening. IVC screening, yeah. We'll come to IVC in the next session. Anything else you can P consider? PCO2, PCO2 gap, sir. Oh, PCO2 gap. Okay. What should be the PCO2 gap? How do you do it? If it is, uh, we, I said, we calculate the arterial uh, CO2 and uh, venous CO2 gas, blood gases. If uh, the difference is more than six, then uh, there are fluid response. Yeah, one of the one mm -hmm. of the measure. But how frequently you utilize this? Do you have anything more that can be done? on a regular basis apart from the ultrasound. If the patient is on the ventilator, we can check for the PPV, so pressure, uh, post, uh, pulse pressure variation. Okay, how do you do pulse the, pressure variation? So, you pulse, pulse pressure variation, uh, that is, uh, uh, it's a ratio, sir, like... Uh, I know, I know, uh, I know. Let's come to that. But how do you look for pulse pressure variation in your patient? So, you have this patient, you have the arterial line, you have the arterial line. So how do you look for pulse pressure variation in this particular patient? Uh, uh, sir, in the arterial line, the, the waves has to be uniform, sir. There shouldn't be any, uh, uh, if there, there is no arrhythmia, so we, we can uh, so, see the contour of the each uh, waveform. So if there is any discrepancy between the consecutive waveforms, that okay. indicates that there is a variation, uh, that indicates the patient is fluid responsive. Okay. The ideal number is, uh, it should be more than 13. So you said uh, the formula. How do you apply this formula when you are seeing this waveform? Sir, if it is the value is more than 13, that indicates that patient is said to be... So how do uh, you get that value? Uh, PP max minus PP minimum by PP so max how do you into 100. Assess, how do you assess that PP, PP pulse pressure maximum pulse pressure minimum divided by mean of 2, isn't it? So yes, sir. How, how do you get that value? Uh, how, do you, how do you check for pulse pressure max, pulse pressure minimum? So pulse pressure max is uh, the, the systolic minus uh, diastolic maximum no, no, value. How do you do it on the bedside? Um, you, it, uh, are you saying that you get the number pulse pressure? We yes, see the sir. largest we'll amplitude the on the see the largest amplitude on the arterial line trace uh, the uh, SpO2 tracing. SpO2 or arterial waveform? Arterial waveform. Uh, arterial waveform. So My passive leg raising and 
by giving fluid challenge no 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 what i am asking is how are you going to objectively calculate that pulse pressure maximum pulse pressure you, what you are telling is all correct that is theory but you have to apply it on the bedside are you talking about a number where pulse pressure variation number comes in the monitor do you have yes sir yes sir we okay. we we get a monitor number so for that you need a module okay yes, all sir. monitors may not be equipped so you are talking about already displayed pulse pressure variation you know the number okay yes That's sir right but many a times you may not have that isn't it you may mm. not you may have to have the module on the monitor to get the number otherwise how can you calculate that we can the maximum amplitude uh, the waveform of the maximum amplitude and we see the minimum and the maximum pressures and similarly with the smallest amplitude waveform on the arterial so how do you calculate the amplitude in that particular patient when you are seeing on the monitor when you do not have the my question we uh, so there there are the there, there are pressure lines on the arterial waveform so yeah. we can roughly estimate it's not accurate uh, yeah. in this you sorry. have the facility yeah i think see most of the monitors have the facility uh, especially philips one other than ppb you can calculate spv by using the monitor waveform what you have to do is first you have to freeze it then go to the cursor get the systolic pressure highest then get the systolic pressure minimum only a systolic pressure variation you can calculate by using the monitor if you don't have a ppb module also okay at the bedside you can do it i think most of you are not done it like that's why people are finding it difficulty but you can try it you can go to your monitor most of the monitors might have this facility won't uh, spv is the one which you can artificially calculate by using the monitor without any facilities yeah you have to freeze the screen and then calculate the pulse pressure maximum and pulse pressure minimum by use utilizing the scale on the monitor and you can do it but that again essentially becomes a sort of static parameter because you are not looking at a dynamic parameter if it is a display of the parameter continuously then it becomes a dynamic parameter okay so basically i was looking you to answer me what are all the static parameters you may consider in this patient what are the dynamic parameters you can consider in this patient of course you told me uh, pulse pressure variation which is a dynamic parameter Uh, what are the prerequisites somebody was answering me so prerequisites are uh, the patient should be ventilated there shouldn't be any spontaneous breathing and there shouldn't be any uh, arrhythmias cardiac arrhythmias uh, and uh, uh, the minimum tidal volume 8 ml per kg has to be there and the peep has to be 5 uh, cm of water okay yeah correct that is the prerequisite for any assessment of the dynamic parameter especially something like pulse pressure variation okay i wanted you to look at uh, the other static parameters if possible whenever you are giving answer for such kind of uh, question like uh, you know how are you planning to assess the you know more fluids you can always start with your static and dynamic measures okay so even somebody told ultrasound ultrasound is also like dynamic parameter or static parameter dynamic it's a dynamic parameter provided you keep it frequently otherwise it is essentially a static parameter okay so uh, let us go to again uh, fluid responsiveness what is the principle of uh, fluid responsiveness so you frank said starling. Uh, sorry frank starling curve frank starling curve yeah so that is based on hartland interaction is it can somebody explain how on mechanical ventilation the uh, you know uh, hart lung interaction happens oh, okay on uh, uh, when the slightly spontaneous the... breathing patient on mechanical ventilation patient isn't it so, so the patient the... is yeah if the patient is uh, uh, mechanically ventilated with the positive pressure ventilation sir Yeah. so because of the positive pressure there will be increase in the intrathoracic pressure so that decreases the preload correct uh, so uh, that decreases the preload but in uh, spontaneously breathing that will be reverse correct so what happens during expiration uh, expiration uh, uh, what happens that is on the rv side what happens to the lv side during the same uh, inspiration uh, so the transmural pressure will be uh, 
transmural pressure will be uh, decreased sir so the afterload will be decreased afterload will be decreased and what happens to filling lv filling lv filling increases during the increases. increase in yes. the intrathoracic pressure because of the compression of the pulmonary veins yes. so there will be increase in the yes. lv output so these are much more exaggerated when the patient is hypovolemic this is what you are going to assess isn't it so uh, this is the frank, frank starling curve you have already uh, mentioned about it so what happens in the flat portion of the frank starling curve there is no more increase in the not, not fluid responsive yeah not fluid responsive in fact it can cause more harm in terms of no pulmonary edema so how do you assess uh, at the bedside assessment of the fluid responsiveness one is pulse pressure variation you told clinical assessment you told uh, you all told and what other modality you said ivc measurement and all you said that uh, vishal you are going to mention about ivc i'll mention about the ivc in my uh, session i'll mainly focus on the focus okay so i will not touch on that so uh, yeah how do you do this uh, bedside i wanted you to tell this but anyway the uh, you know the statement has already come here so how do you do assessment of the fluid responsiveness on the bedside when you do not have or even when you have pulse pressure variation module say okay there is certain number getting reflected there so you want to assess uh, if it is already happening then it is fine it is already showing the number if it is not showing the number uh, with passive leg raising how can you assess the fluid responsiveness how do you assess fluid responsiveness with passive leg raising test that is the question what will you look on the bedside so patient uh, head head should be decreased to the level of 45 degree with a leg raise so that will be having a similar prerequisite uh, like uh, other parameters done like stroke volume variation and uh, pulse pressure variation patient should be having a uh, uh, possible mechanical ventilation of tidal volume 8 to 10 ml per kg and uh, in the meantime we should look for the uh, a bedside echocardiogra echocardiography, uh, LVOT, VTI variations, okay. are, uh, and uh, stroke volume variations and uh, increase in pulse pressure variations. Okay. okay. So can somebody modify a bit? There are little mistakes in his answer, Abhishek. Uh, in case of passive leg raising, you need not uh, the patient need not be on uh, mechanical ventilation even in a spontaneous sleep ventilation. Patient yes. Yes. Can yes, be done. yes. Yes. It can be done. And the uh, failure needs to be done with the uh, initial patient in a uh, semi-recumbent position. Yes. With head and raised. Yeah. Then it is lowered. Uh, the head is lowered and simultaneously the foot end is uh, elevated. And uh, we can either we can measure the all the dynamic parameters like either uh, uh, pulse pressure variation or your uh, stroke volume variation or using your uh, echo to find your uh, uh, stroke volume index. Uh, mm. So using these parameters, we'll uh, compare when the patient was in uh, semi-recommend and when the put end is raised. We'll be able to compare the two values and then we can come to conclusion. And also once we complete the uh, test in a uh, flat position with the leg and raised, you again uh, rechange the position again to the head and raised, and you should also see for whether the pulse pressure which was increased has again fallen back to the normal level. Yeah, so largely uh, you're right. And uh, these things are very important. There should not be any distracting pain when you're raising the uh, leg end of the patient that you have to make sure. And that should not be any uh, sympathetic stimulation to the patient. Right. And everything should be done in a passive manner, not in a active. You should not touch the patient for uh, leg raising. Correct, right. preferably that way. Correct. Right. 
So what I asked is what modality you use. I think a few of you have answered uh, what modalities you are going to assess when you are to assess, look for the assessment of the fluid responsiveness when passive leg raise is performed. So a little bit we touch upon the CVP. So what information do you get by CVP values? Do you use CVP for fluid assessment? Or if somebody says uh, certain value of CVP, will you just tell them that it is completely useful or useless? No, sir, we won't use uh, CVP. Suppose the CVP is there, will it give any information or no information at all? Only in extreme value CVP can be, if it is very less, maybe it can tell that the patient is fluid responsive, not to correlate in a regular practice. Mm, yeah, correct. So I'll not touch upon too much into the CVP. If uh, any of you have doubts or if somebody is using CVP, please go through these things. It's a poor, poor predictor of fluid responsiveness and it may not accurately reflect the preload. Okay, that is a reference if you want to really read about it. And a uh, little bit again, however, uh, less used, you may get questioned on this because this is the basics. So, uh, I'm sure you all are aware of AC, V, and what is the downward uh, waves, the negative waves? X descent and Y descent. X descent and Y descent. And uh, these are all components of the CVP. I'm not going into the detail of that, but I will be asking few wave identification of few waveforms because this may come in exam. So where do you see this? This is the V wave, positive wave, third positive wave. So that you, yeah. can, that you can understand with the problem, uh, the physiology, how the V wave happens, passive atrial filling. No, I will not waste too much of time. Is yeah, this yeah. 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 What is this loss? A wave loss? If. Yeah. Atrial fibrillation. What is this? Large A wave. What is it? Hard block. Junctional. Junctional rhythm and pacing. Large A waves. And where do you see steep, abrupt X and Y descent? Tamponet. Tamponet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, the pericardial risk uh, constriction, constrictive pericarditis. So this is again, uh, more or less the same thing. All of you go through it. This you have already answered, pulse pressure variation. And this has to be assessed over a single breath. This uh, I'm sure you're all are aware of that. So coming back to case scenario, his BP is not improving. CVP is very high, 14. Poor oxygenation is noted. As you said, CVP is a static parameter, but a uh, higher value says something, lower value says something, poor oxygenation is noted, detailed examination revealed sternal bruise of the patient and PA catheter was inserted. I am not going to the indications, contraindications, why PA catheter was in, inserted, but I'm just bringing you to know what is PA catheter, what can be asked in PA catheter. Okay, heart rates 110 per minute, per minute and BP of 90 by 55. SAO2 of 95%, serum lactate 5.8, urine output 5 to 10 ml in the last three hours, hemoglobin is 7. So this is the PA catheter value. Okay, PAOP, PAOP of 12, REA pressures of 14, and pulmonary artery pressure of 45 by 20. Cardiac output is around 5 liter. SCVO2 is around 60%. What's happening? Cardiac output is reasonably preserved. PAOP is high or normal? Slightly on the higher side. PAP is high or low? Normal. High. It's high. What is happening to RA? RA pressures are high. Probably he must have sustained some injury to the RV and RA side because of location of the injury, sternal bruise he had. Okay, this is different patient, but I want you to interpret what is happening here. Not of the same patient. Cardiogenic shock. 
anybody else pop of 12 and uh, cardiac tamponade cardiac tamponade tampon. is equalization of pressures in all the chambers so this is the pa catheter all of you please go through uh, parts of pa catheter can be asked in the exam okay i'm not going to details because of the time limit you know this is how when you are inserting you see step up of the pressures diastolic pressures when you enter the pa when the pa uh, catheter enters the pulmonary artery you no know, and when you are wedging that is how your pressure comes down after the pa catheter once you wedge it shows the left atrial pressure this is called step up of the diastolic pressure so this is again normal values i'll not go into the details can somebody identify this waveform iabp support iabp iabp what is uh, uh, what is d in this what is c and what is you can tell b you can leave a it's okay a is one cardiac cycle what is b what is c diastolic augmentation d is the diastolic augmentation d is the diastolic augmentation, is the diastolic augmentation. Is the diastolic augmentation correct and c is probably unassisted unassisted systolic systolic pressure yeah pressure. and uh, what is e diacrotic reduce iot end diastolic pressure yeah and whereas b would be would have been the dotted line would have been unassisted aortic end diastolic pressure which reduced aortic end diastolic pressure so the more you can be asked by uh, i'm not going into indications contra and what is one contra indication absolute contra indication aortic regurgitation aortic regurgitation so i'm not going to details of indication contra indication what is this same iabp waveform what is happening here early balloon deflation yeah uh, early balloon inflation sorry inflation. early balloon inflation early balloon inflation okay so that can lead to premature closure of the aortic valve and you will have increased oxygen demand of the heart and you will be losing the benefit of iabp similarly this is late inflation late inflation so what is this early deflation early deflation and this is late deflation uh yeah i think i will end my discussion here um uh, i'll hand over to vishal is there anything else you want to ask are are we having any question session dr justin in the end uh we, we could uh, we could open uh, the forum for uh, discussion at the end unless if anybody by the time the presentation is uh, vishal's presentation is shared yeah, yeah. if anybody has any questions to post please do or if anybody want to ask a question quickly you can ask um and if not at the end we can again have a quick session at the end and maybe uh, one or two other comments maybe from uh, uh, if nobody is asking questions uh, any other tips uh, by mahesha akshay uh, rajwardhan uh, regarding the the monitoring devices you can say uh, what or two if you don't mind yeah uh, yes sir in exam they will uh, uh, usually give you arterial line with the complete disconnection and they will ask you to arrange so you need to be prepared for that Uh, the other thing uh, uh, in hemodynamics they can keep any kind of monitors uh, uh, they can ask about uh, as sir said uh, about uh, cvp uh, identification of that so you need to be prepared for uh, like uh, how do you set up things also uh, be, be prepared for that uh, just reading about uh, in detail about arterial line tracing all these things may not be helpful also if you cannot set up an arterial line uh, after knowing full of theory then also it is difficult in exam okay yeah. that is why i had added the question how do you set up arterial line 
uh, there in the exam, it will be handed over as Dr. Mahesh said, uh, is connected arterial line setup will be given to you to set up. So as far as I know, there are only two pressure systems they would ask you to set up. One is the arterial line. Second one is the intra-abdominal pressure. So, so these are the two, two things which people would ask about the pressure systems, how you set up. Arterial line being the commonest. And most of the common questions like a pop test or dampening or, or troubleshooting or uh, values or uh, so SUV charts. Uh, these are the, some, one of the things will come other than uh, setting up for uh, other questions for, the, for this is what I what I'm made to believe. So anyway, we will probably move on to the next session. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Vishal Shanbak, uh, Associate Professor at uh, KMC Manipal. Uh, please uh, uh, start the session, uh, Dr. Vishal. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Justin. Uh, is my slide visible? Yes, yes, it is visible, yeah. Full yeah. screen. Uh, only thing is I want to know whether we can uh, directly go to ultrasound or we have time for a PICO or we can do PICO at the end of the session if you have time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure, sure, we'll do that. So I'm not sure how many people are using PICO. So probably PICO will keep it at the end. Sure. Uh, I'll mainly focus on what we call focus, that is a point of care ultrasound in Shah. Uh, mainly looking at uh, this is called rush protocol. It is very helpful in a patient with a, a shock in an IC or emergency. So I'm audible. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'll begin with what is focus. It's a basically ultrasonography of the heart, lung, abdomen, kidneys, and the vascular system. It is used for both diagnostic and procedural guidance. It minimizes delay, minimizes the delay in the diagnosis and intervention. For example, if you have a shock patient and you think that this patient has got a abdominal, blunt abdominal trauma, or he has got a pneumothorax. So you will have to do a CT scan or you will have to do an X-ray. And you may lose time, which is important for patient and your timely action may save the patient life. So that's where the focus comes into picture. It's very handy. And most of the ICUs now have a, a you know, bedside ultrasound available. And I'm sure all of you do it as a daily part of your daily rounds, routine part of your daily rounds. So it, it reduces the time required for diagnosis of uh, the cause of shock and also helps us to intervene very fast instead of waiting for a patient transfer to CT scan or chest x ray or probably asking somebody else to come and do the scan. So it experiences the interventions and it leads to active mortality. So normally we can use a phase array probe, a one to three megahertz, which is useful for most of the uh, you know, assessments. And sometimes you may need a linear probe, that's a 12, 12 hertz, which is called vascular probe. So we involve mainly uh, three parts bedside, what we call assessment of pump, assessment of the tank, and assessment of the pipes. So pump, we mean the mainly heart, the left ventricular, right ventricular strain, and also something which is causing heart, not the pump from outside, that is the pericardial effusion. The tank, we mean the IVC, and any leaks from the tanks, and tank compromise, like in obstructive shock. And the pipes, mainly we look at uh, you know, aortic dissection, uh, aneurysms, or if somebody has a DVT. These are the most common you know, assessment can be done bedside. To, uh, to see what's the what type of shock the patient is. Yeah, and it takes about five minutes to do all the all of this together. So remember a mnemonic called HIMAP, that is heart, IVC, uh, Madison pouch bilaterally, aorta and veins, and uh, pneumothorax and pleural ultrasound. This is something which you can do within five minutes. So uh, I'm sure all of you know the different types of shock. So mainly we look at the cardiogenic shock, the hypovolemic shock, which is most common in trauma patients or patients who are coming with, uh, you know, uh, any kind of uh, you know, injuries, or uh, somebody is bleeding somewhere. Distributed shock is the most common shock which you find in ICU because of either sepsis or severe sars response or vasogenic. Now, obstructive shock is usually a, a complication of a procedure, or it could be because of a tampon. So this is what we look at uh, when you look at a uh, focus uh, as a whole. You look at the heart and look at the covering of the heart. That means anything which is 
avoiding the heart to pump more. That is what you look at the pericardial effusion. If there is no effusion, you look at the right side and left side together. And also, you see the type of contractility the heart is having. Is it normal? Is it hypercontractile or is it hypocontractile? Then you move to the IVC. Look to whether the IVC is dilated or it is collapsing. There is no need to you know, waste time in calculating the variation. You just need to know the size of the IVC. So if it is more than two centimeters, usually we call it dilated, and less than one centimeter, we call it as collapsed. Then coming to free fluid abdomen, look at bilateral Morrison pouches, and also look for probably uh, somewhere in the pelvis, especially in a patient with trauma. Then if you have opportunity, look also at the aorta, so look for any aortic aneurysm or any, any dissection. Then come to the lung ultrasound, mainly look for lung sliding and also features of new door road. So this is very, in a nutshell, what we can do. And this can all be done within five minutes. So this is the areas which you look for uh, in a mainly rush protocol. So A is mainly for cardiac evaluation. And B is also for four chamber apical view. The IVC is mentioned as a pink color here. Then yellow is Morrison pouch bilaterally and also suprapubic areas. Iota mainly you can look at the epigastric view. Sometimes you can see suprasternal area also. And lung mainly the right anterior just left hand disease, and sometimes you can see posterior also. So what you look at the heart mainly the ejection fraction. So there is no need to calculate any numbers here, okay? Because in a, in a, when you are doing an assessment of a shock patient. It's not important whether the ejection rate is 30% or 40%. We need to know whether it's causing shock or some, something else is causing shock. We just need to look at the heart and see whether the heart is normal. Is it reduced contraction or hypercontracted? Or as I mentioned in the previous slide, any evidence of something like fluid collection which is causing the heart not to contract anymore. And you can also try to look at what are the type of cardiac output you are looking at. Like a low cardiac output shock or what you call high cardiac output shock, like in distributed shock or in case of anaphylactic shock. IVC, we can look at size basically to look at if the patient is hypovolemic or patient is having another cause for shock. Mainly obstructive shock, what we call, or if the severe LV dysfunction causing a non collapsible IVC. M for Morrison pouch, so bilateral Morrison pouches to look for hemoplatin mainly in patients with trauma or hemorrhagic shock. Iota look for aortic aneurysm and dissection, and pulmonary, as I mentioned, mainly to look for pneumothorax. So the first is coming to the heart, what they call the pump. So as you look at this ultrasound here, uh, probably anyone can you tell? So the first image, what you see is a Hypercontractile heart. Okay, so this is a normal contractility of the heart, one o'clock position. What you see at 11 o'clock is hypercontractile. You can see the cardiac contact is very high. Almost the ventricles are opposing each other. And what you can see is the, the anterior leaflet of the mitral wall. If it is going and touching the septum, it's a good contractility. But along with that, if the ventricles also are opposing each other, that's probably uh, an empty ventricle. So it could be a distributive shock. The next one says shows that it's mildly reduced ejection fraction. It may be between 40 to 50. So the content is good, but not as good as what we see in the first image. And the last one is poor contractility, where you can see that the, the antimatter effect is hardly moving. So probably that is going to tell us that the heart is not going to contract and that's a cardiac shock. Are you clear on this? This is called eyeballing method. There's no need calculating anything. Just have to look at the heart and see what type of heart you're dealing with. Is it a normal heart? Is it a heart which is trying too hard? Or is the heart which is mainly the reason why it is causing shock? This is called eyeballing method. There is no need of any calculations here. This can be done within a minute. So coming to a case, a 51 years old male, 
the history of uh, you know drug abuse, met methamphetamine use. Uh, he came with breathlessness for one month, orthopnea, and a typical chest pain. The ECG shows LVH and infilateral leads showing PVO inversions, and cardiac enzymes are normal. So when you look at the uh, focus, when you go to the look at the heart, this is what the cardio looks like. Can anyone tell what is the type of heart you're looking at here? Anyone? Balloon. Rakasubha cardio, my pati. Okay, so what you can see is that the heart dilated. As you can see, the left ventricle dilated, left ventricle dilated, and right ventricle also dilated, right? So it's a dilated heart, right? And the walls are hardly contacting. You can see the walls are hardly contacting. They are not opposing each other. And, uh, and then there's no movement of mitral wall. And hardly any blood is going to the aorta. So what, what type of shock this patient is having? Cardiogenic. Okay, so probably it's cardiogenic shock because of the cardiomyopathy or maybe because of the drug abuse. He has got depressed heart. Okay, so here we didn't calculate any ejection fraction, we didn't calculate any volumes. So just by eyeballing, we saw that the cardiac is not very good, dilated heart. And probably what is the type of treatment this patient will need? How do you improve shock in this patient now? Anyone? How do you improve your shock in this patient? Yes? Reducing the speed load. So what, what intervention will you do? So what treatment will you give to improve the shock? Yeah, BP. Okay. Inotropes. So maybe see as simple as inotropes would be the first choice, then IVP, right? So probably inotrope is the first thing that would like to do to improve the shock in this patient. Okay. The second case, a 50-year-old male comes to AR with hemiplegia and dysarthria. He is known case of uh, ischemic heart disease, atrial fibrillation, with controlled ventricular rate, or is on medication for the last five years. And when he came to emergency, we did a CT scan because he had hemiplegia. It shows a subacute infarct. So you do a bedside assessment of the patient, and this is what you see in the cardiography. So can someone tell me what is wrong with this heart? Is it a good one, bad one? Anyone? A volunteer? Irregularly contracted. Yes, sir. Okay. So how is the heart? Is it contracting well or not contracting well? Apical port not contracting. Okay, so number one is not conducting well. What about the heart rate? Is it regular or irregular? Regular. Um, it is irregular. Okay. Irregular. And the is is an apical clot. It's an apical so, clot. So there's a clot you can see in the effect. There's a clot here. Okay, so hardly any pump is going on because of the hardly any contact rate. So he's got severe form of ischemic heart disease. With atrial fibrillation and there's stasis of blood in the heart because of poor ejection fraction and there's a clot and that's exactly why he had a stroke. Cardioembolic. Okay, so it's a cardioembolic stroke. So what do you see in this case? This is the cardiography. Second, second one. Anyone can see? Dilated LA. Okay, anything else? How about the mitral wall contact? Is it moving well? No, sir. It's not touching the septum. Okay. Reduce. Uh, how are the walls? Are the walls normal or is abnormal? The leaflets. I aortic. Uh, Let's concentrate on the mitral wall first. See, is mitral wall leaflets normal? It's a flyel, sir. Okay. Uh, anything, any abnormal structure is there in the in the leaflets? What is this one here? 
vegetation vegetation okay so there is a feeling of a structure here in the anteromitral leaflet right so it could be a vegetation is the patient already has atrial fibrillation so it could be vegetation and that could be a reason for embolic stroke okay so you need to go step by step and then you probably will be able to find out what's the problem instead of just going and saying this is so just go step by step what kind of heart are you dealing with so identify structures and can it explain the patient condition so then probably you will look for a clue right so next thing you look for is right side of the heart that is right ventricular strain the most common cause would be pulmonary embolism so normally the right ventricle is about two third of the size of the left ventricle so this ratio if it is increased then you can suspect right ventricular strain so the most common cause of right ventricular strain in acute setting when patient is in shock is what we call pulmonary embolism so we look for what we call mcconnell sign and d sign so as you can see in the picture on the left side okay normally this is the normal contact of right heart and left heart relation so left heart should form a donut and right heart should form a crescent over the donut that's a normal in systole and diastole but if there is a pressure overload the right ventricle will push the septum towards the left side so what we call as lv d sign in the volume overload then you can see the right ventricle dilated so in this echocardiography what is the, what is the sign you can see mcconnell sign can somebody tell me what is mcconnell sign can you see the mcconnell sign in this echocardiography on the first one so this is left ventricle right ventricle right atrium can you see my arrow in the, in the presentation yes sir so, uh, you can look at the apex okay what happens here so if you look at the apex you have the septum is joining the apex This is moving hyperactive here, and this is not moving that much. Okay, so there's a free wall hypokinesia, and the RV apex uh, towards the septum looks hyperkinetic. So this is what they call as McConnell sign. Okay, so look for McConnell sign here. So this wall is relatively hyperkinetic, and you see that as if this is over contacting the tip of the RV near the septum. And also, so McConnell sign was best appreciated in the previous uh, echo where you showed the. Yeah, I'll show you another one. Another echo also, and this is the D sign where you see, you know, septum is almost pushed towards the left side. So, what are the conditions where you see a McConnell sign? So, one is massive pulmonary embolism. Second is pulmonary hypertension because of any cause, it could be primary or secondary. So it is the chronic right ventricular hypertrophy or failure, like in COPD patients. Chronic left side heart failure it can pulmonary lead to pulmonary hypertension, and then again you can see a McConnell sign, very rare. And ARD is somebody with very high P hypoxia, also you can sign a D sign. So how do you differentiate uh, pulmonary embolism and COPD when you find a D sign? Anyone can answer? The sixty sixty rule. What is that sixty rule? Uh, we see the uh, pulmonary uh, pressure. Uh, peak pulmonary pressure should be less than 16 in an acute setting. Whereas in a chronic uh, pulmonary artery hypertension, the pressure should be much more than 60. And we see the acceleration time of the uh, right ventricular outflow tract. It should be uh, less than 60 second milliseconds. If it is more than that, it is a chronic uh, pulmonary. hypertension okay something very simple than this uh, i mean this is more i mean you are right but this is more advanced way of uh, assessment somebody who is not a expert there will be right ventricular hypertrophy exactly so you look at the thickness of the right ventricle right so if there is a pulmonary embolism is there a time for rv to compensate it's acute event right so rv cannot hypertrophy in a acute setting so if you see rv wall thickness uh, more than 0.5 nearly 1 1 1 cm probably it's probably is chronically you know enlarged right ventricle so it is mostly because of chronic pulmonary hypertension so if the rv is enlarged or the wall is thickened it is not in favor of pulmonary embolism so if you see a d sign many times in emergency you know they report d sign and then the patient is taken for ct angio so you can easily avoid the ct angio just by looking at the rv wall if the rv wall is thinned out 
from a north node at least normal size then it's most probably pulmonary embolism in a clinical given scenario but if rv wall is thickened then this d sign is mostly because of chronic pulmonary hypertension you need not take the patient for ct and is it clear next coming to the pericardial effusion and tamponade so pericardial effusion is very common in a patient with sepsis many times you see it when you do a rotary echocardiography also but we need to understand that whether it is causing shock to the patient or not okay can someone tell me how to differentiate the patient is having shock is it pericardial effusion is causing the shock or is it just a finding when you do an examination what do you look at to say this is the reason why the patient is in shock if you find a pericardial effusion anyone there will be diastolic collapse okay diastolic collapse right of which one left ventricular right ventricular right ventricular okay right right any, any other clue for you so sometimes it could be a late finding you know diastolic collapse or right atrial collapse right atrial kick what we call which it could be a late finding when somebody is about to go into complete shock or resting but you can also pick up it much more earlier when the physiology pulse changes to transport physiology so what do you look at pulse sparing so pulse products is so very difficult to you know identify clinically it's more of a theory part very simple thing continuous uh, signs and the echo to differentiate from okay so one is you can slow down the echo like you can freeze it and you can slowly pan the echo and see whether the rv is collapsing in diastole and probably ra also is collapsing something to do with ivc can you identify the tamponade physiology with by just looking at the ivc in a pericardial effusion if ivc is uh, distended it dilated is secondary mm -hmm. to tamponade so very very important clue for you that if the ivc is not dilated or not collapsing dilated even though you don't see a huge effusion or even though you don't see a right ventricular collapse but the moment you start seeing ivc become dilated and patient is going to shock that's probably the re reason where you you know suspect tamponade physiology and you probably would drain the pericardial effusion so that's something which you need to remember you see pericardial effusion and shock patient just look at the ivc the ivc is plethoric that means it's a tamponade 90% tamponade physiology and you can always help a patient by just draining the pericardial effusion Okay, I think all of you know how to differentiate pericardial and coronary effusion, right? So you just draw a line between the posterior border of left atrium and the aorta, and anything above this line is pericardial. Anything below that line is coronary effusion. Okay, so two signs which you look at: one is the right atrial systolic collapse, and second is the right ventricular diastolic collapse. as you can see in this picture so normally if somebody is tachycardic you may not be able to appreciate very well you, you better to capture and then freeze your image and then slowly move your cursor and then you can appreciate it very well that rv collapse and ra collapse you okay, can see here this is first one is the ra systolic collapse right and second is the rv diastolic collapse is it clear so the most earliest finding is ra systolic collapse but it will need an expert to probably find it or you must have seen some few effusions then you probably will be able to appreciate rv diastolic collapse is more easy to pick up okay so next you, you just look at the ivc So, if it is distended, not collapsible in the patient pericardial effusion, you probably are looking at a tamponade physiology, and you may help the patient just by draining the pericardial effusion. So, coming to the IVC next, so as you can see in this video, the one on the right side IVC is plethoric; it's hardly changing its diameter, and also there is a dilated hepatic vein. So, appreciate hepatic vein is dilated. as compared to second patient where it is small and it is collapsing in aspiration so this is easy to identify but 
is it reliable in all patients with shock can somebody tell what are the prerequisites to assess the ivc size or ivc variation you can to decide on the ivc variation and then then give give fluids to the patient you must fulfill pre four prerequisites and then only it's valid what are those four points should not be spontaneously breathing okay or at least you should be in a you know calm you know breathing calmly like maybe under sedation not even not, not paralyzed at least under sedation there should not be sudden variation of respiration like cough or somebody should not you know actively expire or cough so if is calmly breathing then that's fine the second one right uh, right heart pathology the right side pathology so what is right pathology mean what do, what does that mean uh in terms of rv dysfunction um, a tricuspid stenosis tricuspid tricuspid regurgitation okay if there is any abdominal so, surgery so not... right there won't be any situation right yeah so that, that we can't use it at that time as a marker of fluid responsiveness okay any other point that could not be any arrhythmia Correct. This patient should be in sinus rhythm. It should not be in arrhythmia. Okay. Other point. Raise raise interabdominal pressure. Okay. Somebody has got raised IAP or if somebody has got raised interthoracic pressure. Again, this is not reliable. Now, what is the last point? Anything to do with the tidal volumes? No. Um. If patient is on a very low tidal volume, like if they're following this ARDS net protocol. Higher so tidal volume. Do I have been a low tidal volume patient? At least it should be more than eight mL per kg or more. These are the four points to consider before you take IVC as a reliable point to decide on fluid responsiveness. If all those four points are you know, valid, then only your assessment of IVC can be reliable to say it's a fluid responsiveness condition. Okay, so it's only fifty percent helpful in a clinical scenario. so most of the times you are half sure about the, uh, the fluid response when you just look at the ivc so you can di uh, differentiate different types of shock based on the you know, uh, lv ejection fraction cardiac output and ivc collapsibility in case of distributed shock you see that the heart is hypercontractile cardiac output is high this fraction is normal or super normal and ivc is collapsible in after the shock the lv refraction may be normal or it may be high but cardiac output will be low and ivc is usually distended because of either tension pneumothorax or maybe cardiac tamponade in cardiogenic shock you have ejection fraction is low cardiac output is low and ivc is non collapsible and in hypovolemic shock ejection fraction is low i mean ejection is high sorry high and cardiac output is low and ivc is collapsible next coming to the m so whenever the patient has got a, especially trauma patients uh, who are having shock you sometimes can do bedside ultrasound to know that the patient needs to go to theater rather than taking the patient for uh, imaging okay so that's where you can look at what the rush protocol so we can do a screening of bilateral morrison pouches and suprapubic carriers to find a free fluid in a given scenario of trauma then mostly it is you know uh, there's a bleeding in the abdomen so there's no need to waste time for you know taking the patient for imaging if it is severe shock he may directly go to ot this is uh, again on the left side and this is in the pouch of douglas in the pelvic cavity next coming to the pipes so mainly look at the aorta and and, and sometimes you can look at the you like know, deep vents of the leg to try to try to find the cause of shock so aorta mainly look at the dissection of aorta it may be difficult for a beginner to identify this but always try to make a habit to look at the aorta in the in the epigastric area and also sometimes in the suprasternal area and if you really do it probably you may be able to pick up some amount of dissection 
the patient who is in shock, you may able to identify dissection. Here you can see a dissection of aorta with a false lumen. Okay. This is longitudinal view. And you can also see here in the aortic cart, dissection is there here. Okay, you can see false lumen here. Here you can see an interval flap in the aorta, descending aorta, mainly in abdomen. And here you can see aortic regurgitation, which could be again a retrograde dissection, basically in the aortic cart. So mainly look at the DVT. So commonly you can look at the femoral veins and popliteal veins. It's very easy to do bedside. So just see the collapsible, I mean compressible or non-compressible. The non-compressible in the patient hypotension, you may suspect a pulmonary embolism. Okay, so this is very quick examination uh, in a shock patient where you can, if you see evidence of you know, pulmonary embolism on echocardiography, just go down and do the scanning of the femoral vein and popliteal vein. Sometimes you may find a non-collapsible vein, which could be a, a clue for you that this is mostly pulmonary embolism. Coming to the lung ultrasound. So mainly these steps of lung ultrasound. First, you look at the lung sliding. If lung sliding is present, then you can rule out pneumothorax by 100% accuracy. There's no need to again rest the patient for an X-ray. If lung sliding is absent, then you should not automatically assume pneumothorax. Try to look for lung points. If you find a lung point, then again, it is more in favor of a pneumothorax. And in the patient with hypotension or in shock, if you find a lung point, then you can go ahead and put a chest tube for it. I'm sure all of you do it every day in your bedside rounds. The normal sliding of the lung. Okay. So what do you call? Seashore sign. When you put a M mode, you'll see a seashore sign. So here you can see the lung sliding is absent. You can see pleural line here, but there is no sliding of the lung. And if you find this finding in lung ultrasound in a patient is shock, you're probably dealing with the pneumothorax. So you should again go ahead and try to screen the rest of the lung to see whether you're able to find a lung point. So lung point is the point at which the lung sliding again reappears. Okay, so as you can see in this arrow mark, there's no lung sliding here, but from this point again lung sliding starts. So this is probably what you call lung point. So lung point is the one of the most pathognomonic feature of pneumothorax. So in a patient with shock, if you find a lung point and there's no lung sliding, you can assume that this patient has pneumothorax on the same side. So I'll, I'll give it one more case now. I will not tell you the history of the patient, but just give you three images and let us see who can identify what is the type of you know, condition the patient is in. Okay, so this is the echocardiography. Hyperdynamic. So, what you can see here? Kissing of the ventricles. The patient is hypovolemic. Okay. What about the contactility of the heart? Contactility looks okay, sir. Is it normal or supranormal? It's supranormal. Super. Okay. What about the IVC? Collapsing fluid accommodating. Fluid depleted state. Rather. What do you see here in the lung ultrasound? Normal sliding. Is there any external sliding you can see? How is the plural line? Is it normal or breaking of line is there? A profile and normal. Yeah, Lung point. Plural line is broken or it is smooth? You can see here. So here it is smooth plural line and here the breaking of plural line is there, right? Looks like consolidation, sir. Okay, so what type of shock this patient is in now? Hypovolumic. Sure. Distributive. Anyone else? Obstructive. Distributive shock. You can suspect. So, so you already told three types of shock. So which one is true? Somebody says obstructive. Somebody says hypolymic. Somebody says distributive. So what is the correct answer? 
So, so you patient. have to cover all the things together. You don't look at one part of it, all same patient. So the patient has come with shock. Hypovolemic. You are the heart, you are a recipient of IVC and lung ultrasound. So what type of shock is this patient in? Septic shock. Septic shock. Like so septic shock is a hypovolemic shock or distributive shock? Distributive shock. So it's more likely to be distributive shock, right? Because there's the evidence of consolidation here. So most of it's a septic shock. And the overall picture looks in favor of distributive shock. Right? Okay, so this is about, you know, whenever you have a low map, you look for high map. So what mnemonic I told before. So you can do a rush protocol and try to find out where is the problem. Is there a problem in the pump? Is there a problem in the tank? Or is there a problem in the pipes? So you can easily identify the, the cause of shock and also the type of shock and saves a lot of time. So you don't have to again go for hi-fi gadgets or ship the patient for any imaging. You can take better decisions to what to do next. So any doubts on this? Uh, focus on rush protocol in shock patients. Justin, do you have time? Um, Eight thirty already. So probably uh, we'll just have, probably have for five minutes of uh, free questions or comments or something like that. Maybe you can also say one or two words about the other pressure volume. So essentially, most of the gadgets are based or maps or uh, or uh, charts or any of these things in these patients is about pressure, volume, or a time. So uh, I guess uh, that is okay with the ventilator as well, the pulmonary mechanics, as well as the hemodynamic mechanics. So uh, most of these things uh, in, in exam, uh, they'll probably have uh, a, either a scenario or just a chart or uh, setting up a system to assess these things. So if you have any of those uh, Comments regarding those things, uh, please, uh, uh, or, or based on I don't know, your experience with the exams, you can say, say a couple of words, please. Yeah. So, how commonly they were asked about PICO in exam? Uh, unless there is a system in in a said hospital, they probably won't. Yeah. So, okay. most likely, most most of the time, I think uh, they will have the charts. Okay. Um, so the charts uh, are li like essentially the IABP yeah. uh, sheet with the with the form or a PPV sheet, or they will get a, a sheet with uh, uh, some numbers. So like yeah. you know uh, SVB and other things like you know Pico value. So I have a feeling Pico values might come like an extra work lung water and things like that, but. Uh, that's going to be quite rare unless it is going to be in some specific centers uh, because South India very rarely people use it now. Uh, I think some some North Indian centers uh, are using it as far as I know, like Bombay or something like that. So I have made about five, six slides on Picto. Uh, if you want, mm -hmm. I, can, or I can share the slides. Please, yeah, please. Just, just keep, uh, just, uh, uh, just I think uh, we can just squeeze through whilst people can ask questions. Um, um, we are going to do these recordings, but we may not necessarily be able to share it before your exam. We're going to put that together and publish. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, but uh, uh, obviously this is our ICSM program. So for us, it is a record that we have run a program. So that's the, one of the main intentions for doing it. But quite a lot of these uh, at some point will get published on the YouTube. So I'm not so sure whether it will happen before 10th or, uh, or 15th. Um, I'm sorry about that, but uh, yeah, we'll try to see if we can get some of these before. And take some questions if anyone has, or we can probably conclude. Uh, Vintesh, uh, you can also just uh, probably unmute and uh, say a few things about uh, the tracings that generally come in the exams. And uh, um, if anybody else is there, uh, um, senior bunch. 
largely uh, basics i feel especially yeah. the line pvp and yeah. uh, so uh, cvp tracing arterial and tracing uh, asking uh, what is what are there and uh, the advanced thing probably is that uh, PA catheter, once in a while, they will ask the, those values. IAPP tracing, quite common. Yeah. Uh, so people, people, please keep like uh, what uh, Dr. Venkatesh had shown, uh, early late deflations, timing, things like that, and what are the... Pulse pressure, what are the, pulse pressure yeah. variation. Yeah, yeah. so I have a feeling because focus is becoming more and more common. Uh, some places may put in some images like a barcode sign and things like that, or McConnell sign. Or uh, if somebody is interested, probably they may use that as as one of the um, guides to assessment and ask you to interpret. Um, so those are the some of the things that I can think of. Uh, so. Mahesha, have you? Is there any anything else that you can think of? Uh, Rajwardhan is still there. Nothing much, sir. Nothing. IVC uh, variability, collapsibility. Uh, so uh, they may ask for indices like that. Yeah. So prerequisites uh, like uh, Vishal was saying, we need to know what all the prerequisites required. So in a spontaneous ventilating and uh, relaxed patient. So we do that on both patients. It is not like we don't do it. So there is enough evidence to suggest that use of IVC variability in spontaneous bleeding patient still is valid. So Somebody answered CO2 gap and all that. Keep your answer in the end. That is not the priority answer, I suggest, though it is. Yeah. 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 So, for, the, so for, for us, the, the commonest way to seeing is that uh, from a, from a sort of hypotensive uh, shocked patient. One is a pressure, the second is a perfusion. We, we, we tend to mix both. So perfusion pressure. So essentially there are two different things. You get the number up, that's called pressure. And you assess the perfusion where it actually is making a difference, like a DO to VO to match. So that's perfusion. So for you to assess the perfusion, you can have a central Perfusion indices like you know lactate, central venous gas, uh, saturation, and even delta gap. So th those are the three things. Whereas peripheral perfusion like you know um, um, capillary refill or uh, skin skin prex, um, uh, um, uh, temperature uh, mottling or even sublingual uh, like you know microcirculatory devices. These are peripheral. Peripheral perfusion. So now you know the difference between the central central measures and peripheral measures, and then we use the pressure in between to achieve those things. So or water, whichever that may be required. So volume and pressure is used to achieve the perfusion. So once you understand that, probably it becomes easier to answer these questions. So I, I'll say that again: we use both water or a, a blood, whichever that may be, crystalloid colloids plus pressure with the vasopressors are on their own to achieve uh, DO to VO to match, so which is uh, perfusion. Am I, am I, am I right, uh, Vankesh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. One more thing I want to add is a slight reg raised test that also please read. Uh, sure I think it is, yeah, it is uh, like you know, it is in France fashion. None of us do it. I, I have not done it because none of our ICU beds are capable of doing straight leg stretch testing. Mm -hmm. but for some reason, everybody wants to ask the question. So please, <laughs> even if you have done it. So the, the best way to do it is that you can do it with emergency trolleys. Quite a lot of new emergency trolleys, you can do straight leg tracing. If you have if you have time, go to the emergency, do for one patient and you will realize it if it is possible. So that's the best place to do it. Most of the beds in ICU in India are not capable of doing the full-fledged leg raising test. You can only modify the uh, way of doing it. Modified way, yeah. Something sure. still doable if you really want to do it on a patient. It is still doable on the bedside. Please, all of you should do it. We have done it, but not, as Dr. Justin said, may not be able to do it on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you have time, you should be able to do it. And it is elicitable. VTI variability is definitely elicitable. So... 
can also you have end the end expiry occlusion test also we can do but sir which is again ex excellent excellent point again uh, any any way to induce uh, like changes in in the cardiovascular interaction so we disturb that piece and then see the variation so that's the idea um, so at the end of the day those things uh, um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, any questions? No, no, no. Uh, so if, if there are no further questions, I thank uh, Dr. Venkatesh Gupta and Dr. Vishal Bhattwaj for their uh, time and effort and uh, despite the short notice for doing this and hopefully um, it's beneficial for one or the other. Number one. Number two, I thank uh, other uh, other teachers who locked in and gave their uh, opinions, uh, Mahesh and Rajwardhan. Thank you for your comments. And uh, thanks for uh, thanks Sunil Mukashi for sharing his experience of the exam. Uh, as we realized that the pop test was his uh, station when the graphics were his station. So I oh, met thank you, sir. Thank we, you. We, yeah, yeah, and.